okay, let's see if I can get through this today. And uh, open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, you can look on your phone. If you don't have a phone, you can look up on the screen with me. And we'll have the, the verses there as well. Um, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to read the verse in its entirety, Philippians chapter 1. So let me get to that. And Paul says, above all, um, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Jesus Christ. Uh, In the NIV, it says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy worthy of the gospel. Now, Paul throughout Philippians chapter 1 has been talking about joy, living a life full of joy, living a life that even though his circumstances, he's in prison, he doesn't have any control over his circumstances, that he still chooses joy, and in the midst of it, he still uses his negative circumstances as a springboard to share the good news of Jesus Christ in his life. And so he says, you know, he says, therefore, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. If you have a Bible, I want you to circle or underline the word conduct there. The word conduct there literally means to behave as a citizen. It's where we get the English word policy from, right? Where you have policy, and what's a policy? If you work anywhere, there's a a business policy that you have to conduct yourselves by. And you read the policy manual, and that's the way you're supposed to behave. Well, the Bible says, as, as citizens of heaven, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And so we are citizens of heaven, the Bible says. In fact, later on in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we are, now, now keep in mind, the Bible doesn't say conduct yourselves in order that you will be able to earn your way to heaven. It doesn't say that. It says basically because he calls them in chapter 1 saints, they are already saved because of the good news that they've heard and received. What's the good news? That Jesus Christ came to this earth, he died on the cross to sacrifice his life in our place so that we can be forgiven. He, was, he, he sacrificed his life, but then he was raised on the third day, showing that he had victory over sin and death. And by believing in Jesus, now we can live forever, know that we're loved, that, know that we're accepted, know that we're forgiven. And so as a result of that, he says, no, 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 now, now that you know your identity in Christ, now that you know that you're a citizen of heaven, begin to behave that way. Begin to live that way. What does it look like to be a citizen of heaven? Well, it means that now you conduct your life in such a way where you follow Christ and his rule and reign in your life. You say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Even when my desires and my hungers and things are pulling me in a different direction, I'm going to trust you. It means that we now love God and we love others. It means that we forgive and we pray for our enemies. It means that we live in such a way where we don't gossip about people, but we actually use our tongue and our mouth and our words to encourage and build others up. It's a completely different way. And so we're supposed to be citizens of heaven. Now conduct yourselves as citizens of heaven. Now as he continues on in verse 27, he's going to give us some action steps on how we can actually conduct ourselves um, in a worthy manner, in in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And the first thing, if you're taking notes, is that he says to unite as a team to advance the gospel or the good news. Unite as a team. How many of you guys have ever played sports before? You guys ever been on any sporting teams? So I played sports growing up. Uh, every sport I could do, I just love being active. And 
And so I remember being on some sporting teams where there were some really good players. Like individually, the players, in fact, my, my high school basketball team, the, the, we had so much talent. But no one played as a team. Everybody wanted to be Michael Jordan. Everybody wanted to be the guy that had the ball and made the shot. And so I, I look at that team and I always just remember like, how are we not winning every single game? It's because we didn't work as a team. Now, I've been on other teams where we were okay. We had some decent talent, but the team chemistry was so powerful, and we worked together so well, and we made sure that everybody was lifted up on the team, and we encouraged one another, that on those teams, we were championship teams. Not because we were all stars, but be, because we worked, and we were united as a team. And, and, I, and I give that illustration because I want to read something for you. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 He says, then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit. Circle this, underline this, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. As one for the faith of the gospel. Now the word striving together comes from two Greek words, sum, and the other one is athletico or athleo. So sum is where we get the word, English word, some, which means with. Athleo means to um, participate in an athletic event. So basically, what he's saying when he's saying strive together, that we are conducting ourselves, we are experiencing, we're working together, we're working as a team in an athletic event. And if you think about the Christian life, it is very much like an athletic event. In fact, Paul talks about it in Hebrews chapter 12 and other places that it's like a race. We're running a race. We're athletes. You're not, you think, I'm not an athlete. You are, though, kind of, because we're running this race together. And, and we need each other in the race. I can't tell you how many times when I was on an athletic team, if I did something, if, if I just was feeling bad or I lost, a, you know, especially wrestling was a big one. We needed, even though wrestling is an individual sport, when we all got together, we trained together, we sweated together, we suffered together, we, we lifted each other up when we lost. When I would lose, my team wouldn't say, oh, you're a loser. You know what they say? Oh, man, well, you're going to get them next time. They would lift me up. They would encourage me. They'd say, hey, I noticed that, I noticed that you went and you reached back. Next time, don't reach back, but turn into, the, and they would give me advice, and they would encourage me, and as a result of the team, I was a better wrestler. As a result of us as followers of Jesus, as we encourage one another, as, as and, and, and the other, you know, analogy of a team is everybody on the team has their own specific strengths and gifts. You're, I played baseball growing up. You probably, some of you did too. Now, some were really good at pitching, others were good at catching, others were good in the outfield, others were good in the infield. And so you needed everybody to be able to play their spots, and then in the batting order, you had some people that were a little bit faster, and they didn't hit very, with much power, but they needed to get on base, so they, they bat leadoff. You had guys that bat in the four position, they were the power hitters, and so they needed to be able to hit the runs in. So everybody had a place in the team. That's the same thing with the church. Everybody here has been given a gift from God. Everybody's been given a spiritual gift. If you are a follower of Jesus, you've been given a gift from God. And that gift is specifically to build up the body of Christ, to advance his kingdom. It's not to just kind of brag about your gift or boast about it or act like you're so great. No, it's to be part of the whole collective team in order to advance advance the kingdom. Some of you, uh, you have the gift of mercy And God has given you this unbelievable compassion and empathy for those that are hurting. That's a gift people have given. Some of you have the gift of teaching. You love reading the word of God and understanding it and learning and taking theology classes and being able to communicate that in order to equip people in the word of God. Some of you are evangelists. Some of you love to share your faith. And and everybody that you come in contact with, you want to share your faith with. And God has given you that ability to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. 
Others of you, you have the gift of helps. Some of you are like, well, you know, the, I don't have that big of a gift or it's like spiritual gift. Guess what? The gift of helps is one of the most powerful gifts in the church because these chairs need to get set up every single Sunday morning. These, these tables back here and the hospitality team and different people, helps is a huge gift. Some of you have the gift of, of giving, giving and generosity. Now, we're all, now listen, we're all to, called to be merciful. We're all called to teach. We're all called, called to um, serve and help others. But God has given some of you that special ability in order to build up the body of Christ. As we're striving together, we're uniting as a team to advance the gospel. There's no better description of this in the scriptures than in the early church in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. It said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. So that's, you go, you go well, what is our church supposed to be about? I don't have to make this up. I have to just communicate what the Bible already says, right? So what do we have? We have the apostles' teaching. That's the word of God. We have fellowship. That's why we have groups here at the church, not so that we can just all get together, but so that we can encourage one another in our faith, and we can equip, and we can learn about the word of God. So that why? So that we can go out and serve others. To the breaking of bread, that's when we have communion, and to prayer. And so we're a church to be about prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, there's that word again, together, and had everything in common. That was where community came from, common unity, community. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Again, verse 46, every day... They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's, it's not rocket science, folks. It's about serving, reading the word of God, fellowshipping, praying, supporting one another, encouraging one another, getting together, getting together. I mean, a picture of this, is a barbecue. I love, I still love old school coal, coal barbecues. Does anybody ever have a, does anybody have a barbecue that still just does coals? Like one, like three people. Okay, good. Um, there's still some, we all do propane now, right? We have the big propane things and we get the barbecue grills. But what about just the whole process? Like, I love it. You, you gather all the coals together, you put them in a big pile and then you put the lighter fluid on it. And I, I always love putting a little extra because I love the little, I like fire, even though I don't like fire. But, and then what happens? The coals start to heat up. Why are the coals heating up? Because they're building off the other coals around them. Now, I've done this before, but if you take one of those coals from the pile and you set it off to the side, what happens to that coal? It gets cold really fast. It's not, like, it's not like it takes a while. No, the reason why it was hot in the first place is it was because it was surrounded by the other coals. And, and I think about in our church, I love to see the seats are packed today. You guys, like, we were praying for you to come to church. Why? Because we know how important it is to gather together. This is important for our faith and for our faith in Jesus and following him. And whenever we get disconnected from the body of Christ, we become like that coal. And we get cold in our faith. And so that's why we need to unite together as a team. And as a result of that, what are we doing as a church? We're advancing the good news to a, to a community and to a world that desperately needs to hear about it. And so we, we unite as a team. The second thing that Paul says is, is don't fear opposition. So when we advance the good news, guess what? We have an enemy, and his goal is to stop us from advancing the good news. His goal is to discourage you, to get you off track, to tempt you, to distract your life, to make you, basically to get you out of the game, if you want to take the, 
the sporting analogy to it. He wants to take you out of the game. And yet, the Bible says, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. He says, you don't have to be frightened. You ever been frightened? Frightened is not like just scared. It's like, oh, you scream. Like it's, I'm frightened by this. But he says, listen, there's going to be, uh, the devil wants to oppose you. There's a world system that is opposing the good news. And we have this internal flesh, sinful nature that we wrestle with and we struggle with. And that's going to pull us towards being, being frightened. And I'll tell you, I don't know about you guys, but sharing the good news can be one of the most frightening things to do. I mean, I don't know, when I share my faith sometimes, I remember one of the first times I shared my faith. I had been a Christian for about a year, and I was taking a speech class at the Santa Rosa Junior College. And you know what? I had just come into faith with Jesus Christ. I, he changed my life. Everything was different now. I understood his love for me. And so you know what I did my persuasive speech on? Why you should follow Jesus and become a Christian. And so I'm sharing the gospel. And as I look out, I start sharing. And people are like, they're mad. They're like, man, it's like, I, I, I'm talking about God's love and what he did for you. How you and I start sharing. The, and I, I was frightened. But then I was like, Holy Spirit, fill me right now. Give me the right words to speak. You know that I'm scared. You know that I don't want to do, that, like, I want to do this, but I'm scared to do it. And the Lord filled me with his spirit that day. And I remember a couple people coming up and just talking to me about what I had done. Now, some people didn't like what I had to say. That's okay. That's all right. And you know what? I want to share with you guys something that happened. My professor, he was Jewish and he was agnostic. Okay, so he was Jewish by ethnicity, and he was agnostic. And I thought he was going to give me an F for the speech, right? I'm thinking, like, this guy's going to give me an F for the speech. He doesn't believe anything that I did, but I had to be obedient to Christ, and I had to share this. I, I sit down with him, and the first, he, he says, that was a great speech. And, he, and the, the second thing he says to me, I think you're going to be doing this one day. And I'm like, I wasn't, ministry wasn't even on the radar, but he's, I think you're going to do it. And he gave me an A for the speech. And I was like, are you kidding me? And here's the thing, here's the point I want to make, is that people are open to the gospel. I think sometimes we talk ourselves out of it, we get afraid, we huddle. The, the, the evil one wants to put all kinds of thoughts in our minds and he wants to create intimidation. But people are open to the gospel, more than I could ever, I mean, like, just this past week, I was in Cameron Park. I was at the, uh, I was at the um, conference, and so me and two other pastors, we broke away from the conference during the budget session. I'm confessing right now, because I guess my name came up during the conference, and it was like, hey, is Billy Andre here? And one of the pastors like, he went to play pickleball. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> why would you sell me out like that, right? <laughs> so... Me and these two other pastors, well, we needed one, uh, one other guy. So we got this guy. He's 25 years old. He's a soccer player, super athletic, only been playing for four months. And the two other guys, that, the two other pastors I was playing with, man, they were, they were great. And so we were kind of all the same level. And so this young guy, anyways, long story short, me and this young guy beat the other two pastors, and we had like this really good connection. And so afterwards, we're talking and he's asking me, like, where are, you, where are you guys from? What are you guys doing here? And I told him we're at this pastor's conference. And then uh, I just, he, he had a, a 9-11 sleeve, like a 9-11 tattoo sleeve. And I said, tell me about that. And he lost a couple uncles in 9-11. I'm like, man, I'm so sorry. And then I just asked him the question. And this is kind of a good lead. This is a qu lead-in question sometimes I'll say. Uh, do, you, do you go to church anywhere? Do you belong to a church? No, man, I, I kind of believe, but... I've never gone to church, and we, he told me a story a little bit. I go, that's kind of funny, because I actually didn't grow up going to church either. And then I told the story about meeting my wife, you know, well, she wasn't my wife in high school, but anyways, uh, long story short, 
I became a Christian when her mom invited me to church, and I told her, and I shared the God, and I said, then I received Christ as my Savior, and I, my life has never been the same, and I just shared with him, and he was just quiet. And then um, a little bit later, he goes, hey, man, can I get your number? Uh, when next time you're in town or if I'm in Santa Rosa, we can we get together and play. And so I'm, I'm planning on keeping in contact with this young guy. It was, it was that easy, you guys. It wasn't even like a big confrontational thing. You know the most powerful way that you can share the gospel? Share your own story. You, you have the second greatest story ever told. The first greatest story is God's story of his sending his son, Jesus. That's the gospel is the first, first greatest story. You have the second greatest story, that you've been saved by him, that you've been loved and healed, and you've been blessed, and you've got a place in heaven. And so don't get intimidated. Now, we, now we are still going to be intimidated, but push through that and be filled with God's spirit and allow him to work through you. People are much more open to the gospel than we actually think. And then number three is, is we view suffering as a gift from God. That's what Paul says. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. It's been granted to you to, to, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, right? You believe, you belong in God's family, you're part of the body of Christ, you've got eternity ahead of you, he, he gives you his spirit, like, to believe in him, right? But also... To suffer. Circle that word, underline it, granted, the word granted. It's the Greek word um, charizomai, where we get the same word charis, which is grace or gift. Literally, when I was doing this word study, it, it literally means to do somebody a favor. That you're telling me that when God allows me to suffer, he's doing me a favor? Billy, that's crazy. It sounds a little crazy, right? Some of you are going through suffering. And you're like, this doesn't sound like a favor to me. It doesn't sound like a gift to me. And yet God, in his power, in his love, is doing something. Because you know what happens? Is in those moments, God reveals himself in powerful ways. In those moments, we realize in our weakness, in our persecutions, in our, in our opposition, in our suffering, guess what happens? God shows his strength and his power. And there's this great story in Acts chapter 5 where Peter and John, they're preaching the gospel. And the religious leaders, they bring them in. They say, don't preach the gospel anymore. And Peter basically says, well, we have to obey God rather than men. And so they... They basically, the long story short is in verse 40, says they called the apostles in, had them flogged, they're whipped, then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, do not speak in the name of Jesus. Talk about opposition, talk about like you're going to, you know, not, it could get worse from here. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching. Oh, man. And proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. I, I love this because I draw so much courage from reading the scriptures and reading about the saints of old who were, were being flogged, being put in prison, uh, some of them were losing their lives, and they were seeing their loved ones martyred for their faith, and yet they didn't stop talking about the good news. Let this encourage you that being a disciple of Jesus requires you to suffer. I'm sorry. In fact, I, you know, maybe you've learned a, a certain type of Christianity that says that it's always going to be easy and it's just a life of comfort. It's not. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 16, he said that, listen, I'm going to promise you one thing. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble, but you're going to experience life to its fullest. You're going to experience a joy that is so deep-rooted that none of your circumstances can ever take it away. 
You're going to experience my presence on a daily basis. And no matter what you go through, you're never going to be alone. But you're going to suffer. And you know, I was reading about, um, first, I just want to go through a couple benefits of suffering real quickly. You can write this down in your notes. 1 Peter 4, 13 through 14. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. The spirit of glory of God rest on you as you're suffering? 2 Corinthians 12.10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because now you're saying, God, I need your spirit. I need your strength. And his spirit and strength comes in. Philippians 3.10. I want you to know, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. We we experience the power of his resurrection during suffering and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And then I love this from uh, Matthew chapter 5. These are Jesus' own words to his disciples. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Did you know that the Bible says that in in Hebrews that those that were martyred and suffered they, they had a more glorious resurrection. They experienced some sort of reward in heaven as a result of the pain and suffering they experienced on earth. This is wild. And, and, and here's the thing, guys. We don't experience a lot of suffering as a result of our faith here in America. We just don't. I mean, yeah, people might look at us a little funny. Yeah, I was... <laughs> The most suffering I had was when I was invi- inviting my uh, neighbor to Easter. And I said, hey, we'd love to have you come to Easter. And I was telling him about the church and stuff. And um, he literally looked down and started kicking rocks and ignored me. And so I was really uncomfortable. I was. I was like, this is really, really weird. Like, I just had this conversation. The guy's, like, not even looking at me anymore. And then so I said... So it sounds like you have plans on that Sunday, huh? You know, I'm trying to like fill in the words, you know. I mean, that's about as awkward as it gets, right? But who cares? This is the same neighbor that when I was going around. So my son has a Bible study on Monday nights. We have 30 high schoolers crowding into our garage to study, to worship together, to pray for each other. God is doing an amazing thing. And Elissa and I, Elissa cooks dinner and does dessert. I'm always like, what, what dessert are you doing tonight? Like, that's all I care about. And, and so I, we, were, we were triple parking in our, in our court. Like, th- like, we were blocking people's houses, literally. And so Elissa's like more wise than I am. I'm like, oh, they can go around or ride their bike or something. I'll, they'll figure it out. She's like, no, we probably should go talk to them, which means you should probably go talk to them. And so... <laughs> I started knocking on the, all the neighbor's doors. I'm like, hey, by the way, you might, you might have seen a lot of cars out here. My son's doing it. That neighbor that I invited to church, I said, hey, I'm sorry we're blocking your car. I just want to let you know we have this Bible study. He, he looks at me and goes, have them park in my driveway. I go, whoa. You won't come to church, but you'll let them park in your driveway? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but God, see, God's doing something. And that's what we have to look at when, we, when we're sharing the good news with people. Sometimes we think it's like it's either they've believed or they haven't believed. But I just want you to, to imagine that there's this big continuum. And on this one side of the continuum is the most hardened atheist who doesn't want anything to do with God, hates God, right? And over here is the sold out believer. And in the middle, that's, there's that conversion experience where somebody puts their faith in Jesus. And, and every time we have this interaction when we're, we're like the light and the life of Jesus in front of someone else, we might just bring somebody a little bit farther, a little bit closer. I didn't become an instant Christian the first time I met a Christian. It was interactions. It was people praying for me. It was, it was experiences that God was putting into my life and as a result of that. And so you look at every opportunity to be salt and light to the world. 
I, I, believe, I believe God's going to do something in my neighbor's heart. I think he's going to become a follower of Jesus. I call him a pre-Christian. He's not a Christian yet, but he's, he's, he's going to be there one day. And maybe the Lord will give me the right words other than, I guess you got plans, you know, so pray for me. And so that leads me to my next, uh, my next point here, and Paul's talking about, is to find strength in fellow believers enduring suffering. Find strength in knowing that there's others that are suffering. When, when, when I was on a, the wrestling team, man, we would, we would cut weight, um, crazy amounts of weight. We wouldn't eat for a day. We would work out like madmen, and it was, it was crazy. We would cramp up. We would be in pain. But we were, we were brothers, man, and we would, we would fight together, and we would battle together, and we would encourage one another. And, and as a result of having that brotherhood, there was a strength and courage that came out of that. And knowing that my, my brother and my brothers on the team were doing, going through the same things. And Paul says, you know, you know the things that I've gone through, and you're now actually going through them as well. And so let's let that be an opportunity to encourage one another to keep going. He says... Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I'm still, I still have. Hebrews chapter 13, 3 says, Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who were mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. You know, the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians that if one part of the body hurts, all the rest of them hurt with it. If some of you, if you are hurting, the body of Christ, we, we need to come alongside you and hurt with you. Suffer with you and encourage one another. And I started thinking about, man, we don't suffer much in here in America. But do you know that there's countries that are suffering immensely for the good news? That I, I, was, I was doing some research. Uh, North Korea, if you found out that you're a Christian in North Korea having Bible studies, most of the times they'll just kill you. Imagine that. You're like, I, I, I'm just having a hard time showing up on time to a Bible study. They're like, no, 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 I, I could actually lose my life. In, in northern Nigeria, um, in, in certain groups, in certain militant groups, and people are, are, are injured, having hands cut off, tortured, horrible stuff. In the Middle East, in Syria, and Iraq, and Iran, Extremist groups like ISIS and Hamas and some of these, these terrorist groups, they find out you're a Christian and you could definitely lose your life. And here's the crazy thing about it. Those areas that are suffering the most persecution are actually the churches that are thriving, growing. They're becoming real disciples they're, under, they're experiencing Jesus like never before. That's the crazy. The early church was the same way. They experienced God like never before. The underground church in China is another one. India is a big place where people can experience suffering under uh, the Hindu supremist agenda. And so, listen, we've got brothers and sisters all over the world who are experiencing suffering. When we look at their lives, one, we should pray for them. We should be praying for our brothers and sisters who are suffering for the gospel. But number two, let us draw courage from that. Let us draw strength that if it ever came down to a day in America where it was illegal to be a follower of Jesus, that you would say, I'm going to follow Jesus anyways. I would be willing to do whatever it takes. And, and I don't take this lightly, guys, because I'm pre I pray for the same thing for myself, that God would give me the grace that if I ever had to suffer, that he would give me the grace to be able to walk through that suffering. And so we need each other. We need each other to encourage one another, um, to, to, to unite as a team, to pray for one another, to lift each other up. We need each other, and we need the Lord, and the Lord is with us, and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Let's pray together. Father, I, I do want to lift up 
right now just Christians in North Korea, and the Middle East and China and India, Lord, and in North Africa and North Nigeria. Father, for those that right now are in prison for their faith, God, would you give them grace? Lord, we even pray for their release. Father, would you protect them? Lord, would you, would you give them the courage to be able to share their faith? Lord, would we draw strength and courage from their faith and their courage? Lord, I pray that, God, you would help us to begin to, to see every single person as someone who is dearly loved by you and, and needs to know this good news of what you did for them on the cross, Jesus. And so, Lord, let us become bold and let us become courageous that we would be true followers of you, that we wouldn't be scared of rejection, we wouldn't be scared that someone might abandon us as a friend if we start talking about Jesus, but that, Lord, we would, that our love for others would override all of that because it's your love for us and it's our love for others that motivates us and spurs us along to share this good news. And I pray even right now, right in this moment, that if there's anyone in this room that has never put their faith in Jesus Christ, that right now in their hearts, they would say, Lord Jesus, I trust you today. I confess my sin to you. I believe that you died on the cross to forgive me. I experience your forgiveness and your love for me in this moment. And I want to walk with you the rest of the days of my life. And so, Lord, I thank you for that person right now who prayed that prayer, that the Bible says that they've crossed over from death to life, and they get to spend eternity with you and a life on this earth that is a better life than we could ever imagine. And so, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.